Hello, everyone. Welcome. I still see some people coming in. Just wanted to welcome you um, this evening. Um, my name is Frederick Jenka, and I'm the executive director of the Carolyn Glasser Bailey Foundation here in Ojai, California. Um, a little housekeeping, we do have live closed captions. So um, those will be found at the bottom of your screen. Um, we also have both the chat and the Q&A open. So, um, you know, uh, feel free to use those. We will be running about 45 minutes with our program and then um, with 15 minutes for Q&A. So we'll take that at the end, but as they occur, you're more than welcome to, to drop them in. Um, this, uh, this presentation this evening is part of our Travel with Artists program and our virtual Travel with Artists program. And uh, on the occasion of our um, exhibition, Cave Painting, Painted Cave, that's currently on view at the gallery at the Hotel Indigo in Santa Barbara. This is a um, fundraising exhibition to support the efforts of the foundation and the Ojai Institute. And we're thrilled to um, welcome Deborah Kerner and Richard Waxberg, who will be taking us on this adventure. You can see their works um, currently on view at um, the Hotel Indigo. And we also launched recently a 3D immersive um, <laughs> a presentation of the exhibition, which can be found at the ohiinstitute.org. And also, I believe it's on the Hotel Indigo site. And there's also um, uh, one on the um, Carolyn Gossip Bailey Foundation site. So there's a few different ways to, to jump into it, but encourage you, for those of you who may not be um, here in, in town with us that you can, um, you know, take a, take a virtual trip inside. Um, again, uh, visiting the ohiinstitute.org and you'll see the, um, the exhibition painted cave, cave painting. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so without further ado, I'd love to introduce um, our uh, artists today who are our, our guides. Um, yes. as we uh, embark on this um, and this adventure. So thank you so much, Deborah and Richard, for um, for being a part of this. And I don't know if there's anything you want to say before we jump into your presentation. Well, um, welcome. Yeah, welcome. Thank Everyone. you all for being here. We're very, very excited. I think we will just jump in and give you the the screen here. Okay. Yeah. So go ahead and share screen. Yeah. And uh, am I in there? Yeah, uh, yes, oh. it just no, okay. to your all right go to your presentation. And we do the slide. There so everybody sees the slide now? Uh, Good. Yes, there we are. Great, right. great. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, turn it off. Yeah, I'm gonna just <laughs> so Richard and I are really excited to take a tour with all of you to cave art, to see cave art and rock art around the world. We're traveling to eight countries. And Richard and I have visited to many of these places. We've spent time there and we've been deeply moved by the art of these places. And we're gonna show you the opening of a cave like this or sometimes a landscape that's around surrounding the rock art. So you get an idea of the spectacular places that the rock art and the cave art are, are found in. All right. So maybe we can just- talk All right. This is La Pasiega Cave, it's in Spain. It's recently been attributed to the Neanderthals, our cousins. And uh, it's about 65,000 years old. And believe it or not, that's 20,000 years before modern humans, us, arrived in Europe. I'm not sure how modern I am. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so I'd like to point out that there is a figure here and some sort of structure. And it's echoed in this shape next to it. Now, did the artist see this drawing that he did, painting, and then um, try his hand at uh, creating something uh, simpler? Mm -hmm. We don't know, but it's fascinating to see the two of them side by side. And this looks like a figure that's seated and another figure over it. And Deb, I know you like to talk Yeah, about we're, it. we're seeing a niche here that we're going to see in many of the caves. We see the horse's head inside of this niche and this dotted, dotted pattern. And it sits as a, a natural opening in the cave. And it begins to give you a sense of the sacredness of the space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And probably the rituals and ceremonies yeah. that were performed there. And of Almost course, like an altar, you could say. Yes, very much. And the, the arch, 
You can yeah, see the arch. Yeah, the whole of the arch. And this form here is actually coming from the ceiling. And uh, it, so you have a sense of the columns that a are sense also. sense of the column, yes. That's it. And we're going to see this uh, repeated over and over and over and over again. This is also the Neanderthal cave, and with this beautiful sense of this dappling uh, patterning. And Richard, you can point out this marvelous horse that's already there, suggested in the in the rock surface. Yeah, you could see the perhaps the back leg, and then the rump as it comes around, and then the head, and coming down. And this would be the bottom of the horse, and where the leg would be. Now there's the Appaloosa. Uh, horses, which are still bred in the United States, and they're known to be spotted. And scientists thought that it was the imagination of the artists at this time to show spotted horses. But now they believe uh, they found skeletons to prove that there were spotted horses there. Yeah, so, which is, and this is 65,000 years uh, ago. Just a quick thought, yeah. which is that putting the spots on this um, incredible stone facade uh, charges it up. And that's, we're going to see a lot of that as we look at caves and rock art, how the images charge up the rock surface and, and bring it alive. Here we're going to Utah in the, in the canyon lands. Richard and I uh, camped near here. We hiked into this space to see this extraordinary facade of 80 figures, about 180 feet wide. And they call this the Sistine Chapel of, of the rock art of, of the Native Americans extraordinary grouping of, of these uh, floating figures, shamanic-like figures, spirit guides. Yeah, so, and you could see they, there are human figures here. We're gonna see a bit of a close-up, and these look a little more human uh, compared to these giant figures. And also the, the um, Native Americans use the rock like canvas, like a huge canvas. Mm -hmm. And you could see that there are figures in the back out of slightly out of focus. So you have a sense when you look at this that the figures are coming at you. They're moving out from some dimension in the rock and moving into our dimension here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can see how it's nested under this uh, sort of canopy of rock here and the size of the humans over here. and. Uh, this sort of incredible space. You've, we've uh, hiked for about three yeah. hours to get to this space. And at the, the time that we did it, there was no one there. And you suddenly come upon this facade and uh, it's actually stunning and breathtaking. Yeah. When did you guys, um, just to jump in, when did you? Yeah, yeah. This? Well, this is in the eighties. We used to drive uh, every summer out to uh, the Four Corners about, for about four years. Well, I should say Deborah and I job shared yeah. Uh, for a uh, publisher in New York. And that allowed us to have a couple of months in the summers where yeah. we could do what we wanted. So we decided to uh, look more deeply into the Anasazi Fremont Indian rock art tradition. And so we went to the four corner states, Utah, Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico. And we went into Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon and Benetokin mm -hmm. and so many of these sites. And they're absolutely stunningly magnificent. And uh, then you come upon this rock art. You have to walk for miles and miles and miles. For many of these places, yeah. This, this one is really nested deeply into the canyon land. And then suddenly these, these uh, images appear and you're, you're just stunned by them, uh, especially since they're, most of them are seven to 12 feet yeah, high. Yeah, these are, these are quite tall, yeah, yeah. This is a, a close up here of this grand grouping here. And here we see that flutist and another uh, close up, the beautiful patterning inside of these figures and the, the, the graphic element of it, the quality, the, the smaller humans here in some sort of perhaps dancing or some kind of ceremony, perhaps a confrontation. I'm not sure. Here we go to France. We go to the Peche Merle cave. It's about 27,000 to 18,000 years old. Richard visited these in the 70s. Yes. Here we go into that womb, into that interior of the Earth Mother, and we meet this extraordinary wall. Yes, and here you could see, we saw the horse before. Um, this is very similar shape. Mm. So the artist saw this shape, this natural shape, and um, uh, painted the horse from the head back, backwards. And I know you want to chat Yeah, we the see hands. the handprints here. Um, we're going to show you more handprints later. Handprints are found all over the world. It's extraordinary, from Australia to Indonesia, 
And they've discovered recently that three quarters of these handprints are actually women's. <laughs> and they're saying now the women were, were artists also. So it wasn't just the guys painting this, yeah. uh, this cave painting, which is so powerful. Yeah. And then again, the dappled Appaloosa horse here. And another beautiful series of line uh, paintings in the same cave here, Peshmerla. Yeah, and speaking aesthetically, just to show how sophisticated these artists were, you could see the shape of this um, mammoth, woolly mammoth, is following the shape of the uh, crack in the wall of the cave. And you're going to see this often, where wherever um, the uh, animals are placed or human figures are placed, there's uh, resonating uh, cracks or, mm -hmm. or folds in the wall of the cave that sort of echo its presence so that the it's merged with the wall mm. and, and as a living experience and by the way this is very shamanic you could see that this is a human leg here and he's standing up really he's standing, he's, yeah standing yeah. up with his long fur over his face and you can see the the tusk here the shape of that tusk abstracted like that coming around and the dappling again here we see that dappling these, these line drawings remind me of Goya or, uh, you know, Degas or, you know, definitely something you would see Very in the West and later much, you know, this, again, we're at 27,000 years. Yeah, and I, well, one more yeah. thing I could say is yeah. that for, for these artists, and I'm, of course, I'm speculating, but to these artists, uh, a simple line could have volumes of information. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we so-called moderns, we need to have dense uh, imagery and all sorts of associations. But for these, um, the, uh, the people who are part of this tribe, this culture, seeing something like this could uh, open up a whole narrative for them. And uh, so they wouldn't need to uh, have all the detail that we think we need. Here we meet the stalagmite and stalactites. These yeah. are in chambers uh, in between uh, where you would see the art. So mm -hmm. as Richard visited these places, there are vast chambers of these forms. You can see the size of the human beings right here. And then you will move in through, through a passage and encounter these paintings. Yeah, so I point out again, here is a, a column. I mean, it's, an, it's a natural column formed in the cave, but these columns are going to be seen uh, replicated and echoed through other temples in India, in France, all over the place. Uh, so, uh, I tell you a little story is that um, I, when you go to these caves, you usually form a little line and the guy takes you in and he has a light and all that. Uh, so uh, one cave I came upon, uh, there was nobody there and the door was open. And I thought, ah, I finally have a chance to walk poke into the cave myself. That's very Richard, go in. <laughs> so I went deep into this cave because there was just enough light filtering that I could kind of see things. And I noticed, thank God, on my left, there were these openings uh, where you could fall 80 to 100 feet to your death. I mean, it was, it, you know, you could see how, for instance, from here to yeah, here, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the distance. And, uh, and suddenly I heard a crashing sound and the guide had, had come to the place, assumed, of course, there was nobody inside, and he locked the door. So there I was completely submerged in this total darkness of this cave. And it gave me a chance, a glimpse, to feel what it was like for the, the people 65,000, 40,000, yeah, 30,000 yeah. years ago to be in the womb of these caves mm -hmm. without a light. Yeah. And um, uh, it absolutely annihilated me. I mean, <laughs> I, just, I just absolutely was shattered by the darkness. And also the sound of silence was visceral. You could you could feel the 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 quiet, the silence. So anyway, I put my hands up on the ceiling, and I walked towards the door, and everything was wet, soaking wet. So by the time I got to the door, uh, I knocked on it, and the guy opened it. Uh, I was covered with mud, and there was a line out there, and of course they all broke out laughing. So that's my little story. Yeah, you know? I, I love that. I wish I'd been there, <laughs> even though it'd be scary. Here we see Cognac Cave. This is 27,000 to 16,000 years ago. It's in a similar area of France. We see the wounded man image here, very poignant with the arrows uh, in his body. 
uh, a, a woolly mammoth here, the beautiful, delicate line. That, the red line. The red line that follows some of those shapes of the, the cave wall here coming around. And Richard, you've talked about these. Yes, well, you, you see these round lines and this red line. Um, they seem to be encapsulating these two eyes. So you have a pair of eyes here, here, and here. And it, it seems as if there are these phantom-like images, entities that are sort of coming out of the wall, and they're looking at us. Yeah. So it's kind of <laughs> very interesting. Another beautiful uh, sort of herd-like sense of the animals in movement across this cave wall. Flowing across Flowing the wall. Flowing across. So you could see the crack in the wall here, if you, I'm following you. Yeah. That. And the artist um, uh, projected the images of the animals along that crack, again, so that there's a sense that the, uh, the wall and the images, the animals, are one, and they're both alive. And also, just before we leave them, so that you could see this looks like a tree here, mm -hmm. and these look like trees. And I think for these artists, the, the, a wall like this represented a landscape, a forest, or something to that yeah, effect. They're, they're, it's definitely immersion into their, their landscape with the animals. Mm -hmm. uh, a beautiful ibex. And I love the way that they captured the staining that was naturally there on this rock and made it part of the image of this, of this animal. Mm -hmm. And so then you can see the, the, yeah. the ridges of the cave here being like the wool that would be falling from the breast of this animal. Mm. Here we wanted to quickly show you Notre Dame in Paris. Uh, we're looking at a cave again, really, the stalagmite, stalactite connection from the ceiling to the floor. The suggestion. The suggestion that. and going moving into the sacred space where uh, it would be dark in the time it was built. This is a Gothic cathedral built around 1163 to 1260. Mm. So, so there, the experience of the cave registered in our collective unconscious. Yes. The art did, but also the cave itself, and it continues to resonate through time as we build our spiritual places. Mm -hmm. We return to the, the Canyonlands and Utah here uh, to revisit some of these spaces that Richard and I just were overwhelmed by. Here's this gorgeous a facade of, of images that you come a long hike and into and suddenly you see this huge rock formation and then these figures floating in the space. We have a little bit of a closer view of, of some of these figures that just dance and float in, uh, in, an, in another kind of dimension, another world. Yeah, very much. And it takes you there, really. You're stunned by it when you're confronted with these images. So the Hopis uh, have a, a tradition. They have a biblical narrative, just like people from all over the world. And they say whenever there's a crisis in the world, uh, a catastrophic crisis, they're taken into the bowels of the earth by the ant people and they're protected and kept there and they're fed. Mm. And when the crisis uh, finishes, they come back out again. So you can see this looks very much like an ant person. There's the antennae, there's the uh, roundish head and the thin neck. Here's the antennae. Mm -hmm. the antennae, the rounded head, the thinner neck. And also, um, at this time in our history, uh, human beings organized themselves around clans. So there was the spider clan, and there was the snake clan, and uh, all sorts of clans. You can and see that the snakes right here. We know the Hopis also dance with uh, the snakes, rattlesnakes, literally holding. I don't, know, I don't know if you've ever seen photographs of this, but it's extraordinary. So we're definitely seeing... And these paintings, these are called pictographs. They're usually painted with a, some kind of overhang over them. And they're ranging in dates throughout these canyons from 2,500 years to 800 years old. Right. So I just wanted to point out that this looks like uh, a guide from the um, spider clan, and so does this. Down yeah, down. yeah. And then also the presence of the animal here. We're seeing this worldwide also. Oh, another fantastic, imposing sense of uh, these, these figures. We had a photograph of Richard standing about this high, so they are larger than, than life size. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, um, so Deb and I uh, were very interested in uh, the history of art, and so we uh, traveled mm -hmm. uh, all over the world, and uh, not everywhere in the world, but in many, many, many places. places. 
And uh, one reason for looking into this art, this ancient art, was to see if we could discover the roots of all art. Because, mm. I mean, they go back so far that um, uh, uh, they've sort of created a registration in our collective unconscious. Mm. And no matter what culture came after them, some aspect of their art is um, uh, bleeds through into their, mm -hmm. or infused. I like mm -hmm. that word. Mm -hmm. These are petroglyphs on an, on an extraordinary rock surface. You can see the shape of the rock reflected here in the petroglyph. The petroglyphs are, are tapped in, chiseled into the rock. Well, the, you're right. So there are two stones. One is a chisel-like stone, and one is a, a hammer-like stone. And the artist taps on the chisel-like stone. And the, there's a patina uh, that's formed in various places in, the, in these desert areas. Uh, about 2,000 years. Yeah, they take it, it's it called a desert varnish. And it's a kind of dark uh, reddish blue, as you can see. And uh, when they tap into it, the lighter colored rock underneath, the natural color comes through. And it's, it's kind of like an engraving. You know, yeah, it's a definitely an engraving. And when you see this many uh, petroglyphs in one place like this, you can imagine the people's coming through their travels, they encounter this extraordinary rock form, and then they leave their own marks also. And you see all kinds of animals, you see a gorgeous birthing scene in here. Yes. And uh, yeah, so this is a, oh, this one is a beauty. Uh, it's a hunting scene. You see the, the hunters here with their bows and arrows and the herd of animals with a shamanic figure or a spirit guide in, in, in the center here, moving with the herd mm -hmm. on this beautiful facade of rock. Extraordinary. This one has a lot of charming, the owls, the lovely little insect perhaps in here, the, 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 owl. the, uh, the owls here, you have a couple of the owls, the, the bear paw mm -hmm. and how it rounds into the space. And then again, the canyons are just also vibrating their vitality to you. Yeah, and these are very quiet spaces, I should very imagine. Quiet, yeah. So um, when you look at this rock art, just like when you look at the art in the cave, you are transported out of the ordinary mm. and you leave everything behind, your history, your sense of identification, who you think you are or yeah. and all that business, and you're transported to another world. This is a very lovely kind of, um, with a lot of abstraction here, you see this kind of form looking like mountains, the zigzag here, and a lot of the dot patterns. We saw those dot patterns also in France. It continues here to, as well with the herd. Yes, I'd like to point out that we were looking at this the other day, mm. and then we noticed this profile. Mm. And then this side is also a profile. And Deborah likes to put a profile right, I do. I, and I, I, heads yeah. into her, the latest With series. line like this. The so I, I was actually quite surprised as Richard and I have been immersing in these images again recently to suddenly see how all of this is kind of coming through in our art, which yeah. you'll see a little bit later. Another beautiful facade here, this magical shaman here with this, uh, we think it's a bull roarer that he's, he's a, uh, turning and making a sound with. Yeah. So bull rora is, it, it's really almost any shape, but, but usually it's a flat rectangular shape with a string, um, a rope attached, and they twirl it around very, very fast. And it has a frightening sound. And uh, uh, it was, it's all over the world. But in Australia, they would take the adolescent boys away mm -hmm. from the mothers and uh, they'd steal them actually in a ceremony and they would put them into this hut and they would be told that uh, there's a demon coming to eat them. <laughs> and uh, the, the sound of this thing, you can hear it on YouTube. It, it really sounds like a monster. <laughs> uh, so they would, so at night when things got really quiet, the elder, elder men would appear and they would swing these bull roars and they'd say, that's the sound yeah. of the demon. And it would absolutely terrify yeah. the boys. Right. The idea there was to bring up on a psychological death and in that psychological death, a transformation to mm. an adult and a sense of responsibility yeah. for the tribe. You know? And he's quite, quite rare, this floating figure with these sort of insect-like insect legs, his horns. Mm. Or antennae. Antennae. This is called newspaper rock. There are about 650 petroglyphs here that also would have been placed over, you know, probably a thousand years. 
I love the way it sort of cascades down like a blanket mm. off the wall here. The great, beautiful bear, there's nothing like him. We haven't seen any others and with his hunters, the bows and arrows. This is the great birthing rock here. You encounter this and it's quite, quite uh, shattering to see this. And I always say she's, she's birthing the cosmos. She's yeah. just uh, <laughs> extraordinary. Yeah, and Deborah and I like this. It, uh, and one finds these and they're, they're sort of uh, uh, fantastical and reminds us of Paul Clay mm -hmm. uh, yeah. because it's, it is a certain delightful quality yeah, that it has. Yeah, kind of and whimsical. Whimsical, and it raises the question, what is it that attracts us as artists and as human beings to abstraction? What is it that attracts us? And certainly one of the things is that in abstraction, we could see something fresh. Mm. So the, the eye is not used to it and it, and there's a little puzzle involved in abstraction. And so there's a, a bit of a detective work needs mm -hmm, to be done. Mm -hmm, and I think that's part of the charm of it. I love the way they're all lined up like this. Mm -hmm, yeah. Here we go back to the caves in France. This is the cave of the Trois Frères, the three brothers. You can see that door there. I can imagine Richard sneaking through that door. <laughs> <laughs> banging to, to get out. <laughs> right, banging to get out. <laughs> and then here you go into the interior of that cave. You're seeing those um, uh, columns again that look like temple-like, really. And then you encounter this extraordinary sorcerer. He's uh, really unique in, in French cave art. Uh, uh, an artist has rendered it so he is showing us, or she is showing us, what this, this uh, fairy anthrope they're called, a half human, half animal, or definitely uh, inhabiting this, the spirit of the animal here. So in, this was a time when Deb and I were exploring all these spaces where we were involved with uh, shamanic Native American culture. Mm. And we were very good friends, dear friends, actually, with uh, two shamans. One was Wallace Black Elk, who was a Lakota a shaman, and then Rolling Thunder, who was Cherokee. And um, uh, uh, Rolling Thunder um, turns into a badger. Yeah. I mean, that's his that was, very that on top. Yeah. So he showed us one day, he, didn't, he was he was rather old and, and he was time. a bit ill, <laughs> but he sort of went into the badger <laughs> and it's grunting like the badger. It was, he definitely had that energy. It was, oh, it was with, yeah. wonderful. And uh, I remember Richard saying, just encountering these, these are bison that are created out of the clay from the cave wall. They're about 24 inches wide, about 18 inches high and totally rare, unique in, again, in the uh, French caves. You yeah. can see the beautiful incision here, how they're, and they're very lifelike. They're oh. just, remind me of the Goya bulls. And, and true to the form. True to so the form. Here again, there, there's this, um, mm -hmm. the actual natural rock itself that, they're, um, that they were created against. So it's like, there are three uh, uh, entities here. Yeah. And so the natural bulls are with this spirit entity, and they're moving together, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, another way that they create art is through its, in the incised line. And you can see how it follows the natural crack of the cave. They're using the, those cra crack lines to show you the leg of this mm -hmm. animal. Yeah. It's got a very lovely, sweet face. Following the line here, the ear coming around like this. And uh, as Richard describes with the light, the oh, guide yeah. would show you the light here. Yeah, so whenever we came upon an incised um, image, the, uh, um, the leader would put the light against the wall of the cave and the animal or image would spring into being. Accentuated through the shadow. Because you'd suddenly yeah. see the shadows uh, uh, become very sharp. And it was, it was really something else. And of course, the, the uh, indigenous peoples who did this, the ancient peoples, they had uh, oil lamps. They, well, oil lamps were found in the caves and torches, of course. Yeah, I and mean, you wouldn't see it, uh, you know, lit this well. So it would be much more shadows and flickering and uh, very magical, creating, a, again, another world. Very animated. Yeah. This is uh, Gilf Kabir in southwest Egypt. Richard and I have not uh, traveled here. We'd like to. You can see a human here walking through these huge formations in the Sahara Desert. And inside is the cave of the swimmers, which... Uh, I've been very attracted to, I just love, I, I had seen it first depicted in a film called The English Patient, but recently got back, somehow discovered them again, their whimsical, lovely sense of swimming 
This area was quite lush with lakes at this time. This is 10 to 8,000 years ago. These figures have uh, been swimming for that long. <laughs> and uh, I just thought they had such a lovely delicacy of line also. Another example. Another example of the swimming. So playful. They're so playful, yeah. Here we go to Ajanta in India. These are Buddhist caves. You can see this extraordinary rock facade here. There were natural caves here that have been then sculpted right out of the rock. This is an extraordinary place. You go, also we had to take a long, long train ride. Ten hours. And um, you go into a very hot, humid jungle and you're just seeing this extraordinary, uh, uh, you know, way of uh, creating spaces that you would never imagine could Sac be there even, you know. Sacred spaces. Sacred spaces, sacred. yeah. So here again are the columns which replicate the uh, stalactites and stalagmites. And you could see that they, they were good engineers. They had to know exactly as they carved into the rock and moved into deeper into this cave uh, where everything was going to be. So they could lay out the right. passages and the columns yeah. and everything, because it's all just cut right into the I stone. love the way you see the, the natural uh, rock formation here. This is it's quite extraordinary to see both the sophistication. Then you enter into that womb again and you enter this, this cathedral like we saw in France much later. These, these date from about 2200 to about 1350 years ago. And the stalagmite, stalactite configuration from the, from the ceiling to the floor yeah. and the natural floor there. And then these extraordinary paintings. These were, the caves were probably uh, carved over a period of a thousand years or more. Mm -hmm. Some of them have these extraordinary paintings. Some of them are simpler. Here's a, a detail of this prince, and there are Buddhist legends and stories that we're seeing. And this lovely couple, they are so sweet, and she's just so lovely with the prince and the princess. He's They're over a, a doorway. He's comforting her. He's right? comforting yeah, her, he's yeah, yeah. Then we go into another jungle, which is the Mexican jungle. This is near the border of Guatemala and Chiapas, uh, Mexico, and it's a Mayan site. <laughs> Yeah, so um, Deborah and I, the only way we were able to get here, there, there was no... Uh, no buses or yeah, transportation. Yeah, we, had to, we had to fly. <laughs> so we hired a, a Mexican flyer. He was a tiny, tiny man. And it was, it was a tiny plane. A tiny <laughs> plane. I mean, the three of us just barely yeah. fit in there. And we flew for at least an hour over this vast jungle. And yeah. all you saw was a canopy of trees. Nothing, no openings, nowhere. And then suddenly the train, the plane started diving down. Yeah, yeah. And he uh, uh, went on tiptoe and put his face right up against the glass of the of the plane to see if he could see over the propeller. And only I would say within a minute before we landed, yeah. suddenly next to a river uh, that suddenly appeared there, you could see there was a little strip. Yeah, I must say, we, we had no idea what we were getting into. Yeah. And this was much more, our jungle was over this. There were no tourists. There was nobody here. And uh, you see these temples. So you're seeing the, the column formation again. And as you go into them, they have a cave-like presence. And these are fresco, also like the Ajanta Buddhist caves. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing the court life of the Maya. There's nothing like this anywhere in the whole uh what they at least have discovered so far in the Mayan sites. Yeah, and the mischief of the Mayan. And, yeah. So now, beautiful color. As Deborah mentioned, there, yeah. there is no, no other interior space in the, the entire Mayan world, at least. Nowhere yet, do you see this kind of painting. Where you could see yeah. this kind of painting. And they're about 1,440 years old to 1,220 years old. Here we go back to Colorado. This is Mesa Verde beautiful canyons and the extraordinary cliff dwellings. And they're about 800 years old. Yes, and when you if you're interested in architecture at all, when you come upon a site like this, it's, it's way up on the top of the mesa, and they may have done that to, uh, for protection, I guess. Um, you, it's like it's floating in another dimension. You can't believe it. And these are the kivas that were used to uh, perform their rites of passage and their ceremonies. And they used these ladders to get down into them and they were covered. So they were dark spaces, very yeah, much like the cave. Like so the again, cave. it's going back the ritual to the cave. Into the cave. And then down the trail from that, you, you encounter this lovely uh, facade of petroglyphs. Yeah. Like uh, the, yeah, they, 
they followed the line here of the natural rock and the line itself, you can see, continues that line. So it, it, it looks so beautifully designed, so perfectly placed. Mm. Here we see a, a close up of these magical spirit beings and the animals and some of the more geometric abstract formations. They look like monkey images. Yeah, yeah, they could. This is Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. You can see the humans here. This is a, a really a city, a huge city in the half circle. And these are about 1170 years old to 770 years old. We wanted to show they just the beauty of how this is positioned in the canyon, the kivas here, and this road takes you down to Mexico. So there was trading with Mexico. Yeah, and you could see how the wall, they can point it to it. Yeah, the wall here. It was a very high wall. Very high wall, beautiful adobe bricks. And, and there was no place in Europe that was comparable to this. Yeah, it, it's, it has a beauty and a sophistication. Here we're going to the Chauvet camp uh, cave in France. Uh, you can see the beautiful undulating uh, facades in this cave. And this was discovered in 1994, more recently. It's about 37,000 years old. Yeah, and here again is the horse inside of the apse. And uh, again, probably some kind of ceremonial um, yeah, yeah. significance there. And, uh, and this looks to me like a shaman. Yeah, you know, you know. again, standing, you standing. see this woolly mammoth. And uh, uh, probably wearing uh, a, the coat of the animal or perhaps replicating it in some way through different materials. And you really have a sense of the teeming herds that you would have seen as you stepped yeah. out of that cave here. Rhinoceros, these are all Paleolithic animals. And the undulation of this cave is really quite extraordinary, the way the animals are placed to emphasize that. So here's another shaman. You can see the human leg here. And um, sort of like a Picasso. Yeah, know, like a Picasso, you know, yeah, really, he, yeah. Way, uh, oh, again, going back to the Goya bulls, his, mm. uh, his etchings. And the cat family, the Panthera. Uh, I don't think I've seen uh, cats like this in any other cave yeah. uh, in the area. So most unusual. And I like the laughing cat up yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very strange, and yeah. you could almost hear the roar. Yes, you could, you could feel their intensity. Oh, yeah. This cave is not open to the public. Uh, it's very fragile. Uh, we wish we could see it, though. You can see a, a, a wonderful 3D film called Cave of Forgotten Dreams by Wer Werner um, Herzog. In 3D? In 3D, yeah, which is really fun. <laughs> uh, it, you which get a saw. sense of this <laughs> undulation. Yeah. Uh, this is a dying rhinoceros, mm -hmm. and these are handprints that. Uh, oh well, yeah, a... and, and this just you can see faces in them, mm -hmm. faces in these, and the fact that there aren't too many fingers shown in these handprints suggests to me that that's what they were doing. They were making face uh, prints of faces. And speaking of hands, this is a, a canyon in Argentina, the Great uh, Wall of Handprints. Um, they are about 13,000 years old, and there's something so delightful and something so joyous in these hands. Again, three quarters of these hands would be women, and I think you would see some children here as well. These are in Utah, about 800 years old. Mm -hmm. And this is an incredible facade in Australia with hands, boomerangs, as Richard points out, you've got Flying some UFOs saucers. <laughs> and uh, all kinds of wonderful forms. And we wanted to show you a few abstractions. This cave is, is Spanish, 15,000 years old. So 15,000 years ago, they understood uh, the, the architectural possibilities the, in, in image creation. I mean, this could be a future city. It could be a city in their minds that they could have lived in. Mm. It could be some of the objects that they created for themselves, the part of their tools. Mm. The point is that they were able to bring this, the ideation of what we think of as modern structures into their life and um, part of their creative culture. And I just love the whole graphic look of this. It could look like a modern painting, the dot pattern moving oh, through easily. it and yeah. has a great beauty to it. These are wonderful looping uh, etchings in a, in a cave in Spain also about 15,000 years old, quite unusual. And this is Lascaux, it's uh, 17,000 years old in France. Um, we wanted to point out the abstraction of, of using the line here to show the arrow movement through the bison 
Uh, he's eviscerated here, his bowels. And as it moves through and possibly it hit this wounded man here, he's dying. It looks like he's possibly dying and wounded. He has a, a phallus here. And then his bird, it may be his uh, totem. But the use of the line to, to carry through and then carry through to that figure. As a design element. As a design element. And of course, the graphic line here of this animal is extraordinary with the incisions that are naturally there in the cave as well. Here we go to Australia and the outback. Uh, you see the temple here and these amazing columns and their, their fabulous line uh, graphic work here on their ceiling here. And that's about 28,000 years old. Yes, and just a, uh, uh, an interesting point is that these columns were actually moved around over thousands of years. So they, they, re, they redid the space a number of times mm. uh, for their, again, their rituals and rites of passage and they moved these around to accommodate that. We haven't had a chance to, to travel to Australia too, but there's a tremendous amount of rock art. These are about 18,000 years old, and we love the elong elongated form of these figures, reminding me of a little bit of El Greco, the beauty of this sensitive figure here, sure, and the these headdress. long headdresses. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. And these are the Wajina um, spirit beings uh, that come from the dream time in Australia. And they're about 4,000 years old. And actually, artists, contemporary artists continue to use these, these configurations now yeah, in Australia. At, look at the one that's the one fading here. Fading, he's fading out. As, as if he hasn't in. fully yes. uh, emerged into the present, you could say. You know. And here we go to California. This is the painted cave that inspired the show. This is the opening of the cave, a beautiful opening here. You see this fant fantastic forms here and the lovely painting inside. We saw some of these circular cosmological forms uh, back in, in Utah on their, some of their petroglyphs. And this is a close up of this scene where you see the apse, the shaped out sense of that cave. Yeah, so this is a figure and you can see the two legs and the hip here. And of course, this is the upper part of the figure and Deborah thinks those could be ovaries. Yeah, they look like ovaries to me. But this beautiful curve of the figure is actually in the cave itself. So here again, the artist is sees this beautiful uh, crease in the cave wall and chooses to place the figure against it to accentuate the, the mm, lovely- And I, I love the, the black and white line. It reminds me a little of the Ajanta garb, you know, Very cloth much. that they were using in India. Very much. And from here, we move to Richard's paintings and we're almost finished. <laughs> we're gonna go through a few of Richard's paintings and then my yeah. own. So, uh, uh, was it the seventies that I lived in? So yeah, early? yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I had, I had a loft, I lived in a loft uh, in the 1970s and I did very large paintings. And um, this painting is uh, part of a series. It's nine to 10 feet high, about 12 to 13 feet wide. And you can see it's a bison shape. And uh, these are other images I was working with. And they, they, they have a cave-like- They do, the surface. Surface, and this, I can't go into the story here, but you can see the animals and the figures sort of intertwined. Mm -hmm. And Deborah thought I should show this because the surface looks sort of like a Remind cave me surface. of the, the sort of the line, the natural lines that you see in the cave. Uh, texture of that of the walls and the abstraction going yeah. to the and then the line of the animal over it yeah right. and now this image this image and this image and i think this one too yeah it is they, they deborah was looking at a book on tassili tassili algerian rock art rock art and i like those images and i wanted to put them into this painting because I, it's just a feeling i had that i wanted to bring out and you could see these floating heads are somewhat similar to the Australian heads. Mm -hmm, yeah, a little bit of Aboriginal and reminds me of the handprints too, when you see the faces coming through. Mm. Yeah. And this painting is in the show and um, the, each one of these panels looks like, a, like it was peering into a cave. It reminds me of the Mayan glyphs as well. Mm, good point. And this is the last one I'm showing with my work. And you could see I've used a schematic behind this, this is sort of modern uh, figure. Uh, which traveler, is, traveler yeah. and very much like they use in some of the caves. And, but I wasn't aware of that when I did it. Mm. So I, I must it. say true that uh, they uh, looking at all this uh, 
rock art and, and cave art, it's subliminally coming through, uh, I, I would say for both Richard and I. I painted this self-portrait at the time that we were going to the, into those canyons. Mm. The canyons were, felt alive to me, that I, like actually figures, beings. And I did a series of uh, iconic animals. In fact, there is a grasshopper in the Chauvet uh, uh, cave in France, it turns out. Um, th these are a series of lino prints. Beautiful series of lino. Oh, thank you so much. You have a, a suggested abstract form here that's uh, some kind of interaction with the figure created in line. And uh, the overlap here of the line, when we were talking about that uh, profile, the hand, which we saw so many of all over the world, and the, the, the uh, dotted pattern journey line here, and animals up here as well. Um, and then someone told me they thought this looked like Aboriginal uh, art. This is also in the in the, uh, the cave painting show that uh, we have at Hotel Indigo. Mm -hmm. And this was the beginning of some of these swimmer series that I showed you from uh, those great uh, figures from Egypt. And that inspired. Yeah, yeah, this one is in the show. And this is a very recent one. And I even see the rhythms here in this painting as being somewhat like the rhythms on those cave walls. And that is it. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> so I'll, I'll stop the share there. You guys did such a great job. Thank you. So oh, you're so Thank nice. You. Well, you know, we have so much more. To yeah. <laughs> so this will, there'll, be a, um, there'll be a part two for sure. Oh, yeah, good. We, we would good. love that. I, I feel like, um, you know, in the best way, I had this kind of whiplash. <laughs> of happening, you know, around the world and how the only way you could really do that is by um, sitting in front of a computer. <laughs> yeah, that is so <laughs> true. That is so true. Now, maybe they haven't invented the, the, tr the transportation technology yet. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I want to thank you so much for this, for this adventure. And oh, we really I, enjoyed I, it. <laughs> I would like to also open it up. Should anybody have any yeah. questions? Um, sure. Yeah. You know, feel free to drop them into either the chat or the Q and A. And while we're, um, while we're you know waiting for anybody to to comment, yeah. I will also um, start with a with a question that I have, and you know I think it has something to do with the experiential um, element of like of being with these pieces that you touched mm -hmm. on a little bit. But mm -hmm. I would love to maybe hear a little bit more about you know what did it feel like when you're looking at some of those rock some of the rock art in those canyons, right? You've like kind of set the set the mood so you've walked you've spent like a couple hours maybe yeah, yeah. in the a lot of hours. Sun or you know like yeah i mean i imagine too that there's um you know perhaps a bit of a euphoria that comes from the fatigue i don't know like yeah I'm that, I think that's true. About, about about what can you speak to kind of the, the the physical feeling the mood of being there in front of some of these pieces yeah, well one thing i could say that yeah. I'd, I'd love to hear mm -hmm. your, your thoughts as well is you have a sense that the the uh, images on the rock wall sanctify the walls they 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 have a similar feeling as walking into a temple because uh yeah, their presence is there and it's still there it's still resonating yes very much yeah so, i would say that same thing that i could really feel the presence of those artists uh their whole sense of uh, uh using the line using the art to express something very deeply from within to uh charge the landscape to charge the whole uh sense of of being able to um move into dimensions of that would be normally unseen and to kind of bring out their vision uh so there's a real there is a real presence of the artist yeah. and then also of the ceremonies that that probably were happening there the rituals yeah. uh, the dancing the sound the the you know the the singing the chanting um these are yeah. vast spaces by yeah they're, they're, and they're so vast that you're different. already in this other world you're di you're diminished in your the whole sense your whole orientation is absolutely diminished and shattered in some yeah, in some ways. That's true. I would say states. that. Yeah. I remember Canyon de Chez going into Canyon yeah, de Chez. Yeah. It was a vast um, wall uh, at one end of the canyon mm. with these gorgeous stains looking like a Morris Lewis, by the way. Yes. And uh, you you cannot believe the scale of, yeah. um, of, that you're entering into. And when you're at the bottom of the canyons and you're looking up, 
I, it's you know, it's like being in in the uh, uh, <laughs> nothing, nothing that man, nothing, nothing really, man made yeah. could uh, you know yeah, invade. You're us. right. You're right. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I think that's an interesting component too of the spiritual and the sacred and mm. you know, ha, I mean obviously there's lots of feelings around religion and beliefs and cosmologies but um, you know I think it's remarkable that that this was all created and there we, we don't know right yeah. we don't know and maybe we'll never know in some cases we still have indigenous groups and and people it's that true. carried on these traditions, but maybe in, in a way, I wonder, like, was there a site that that you visited in person that still to this day sort of, you know, surprises you in its mysteriousness or just still kind of boggles your mind with how it was made or, or what are the feeling or the mood? Yeah, you, well, you mean at the rock art? Right? Yeah, I mean, I would- at the rock art or the caves yeah. of these experiences you had. Yeah. I was I was boggled uh, every time I have to say, um, and you know another thing that I think happens is it, it's like it tunes up your seeing, uh, it it uh, stimulates uh, a very um, kind of intense kind of scene. A sensitivity. Where a sensitivity, yeah, um, and um, it's it's like something that um, it's you you uh, uh, just. You have a hard, difficulty to explain it, really, because you're words. encountering, yeah. uh, and you're also in these open spaces or inside the cave. It, it's not an experience that's easy to narrate. I, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Yeah, um, because any any time you narrate something, of course, you reduce it. I mean, that's the nature of storytelling. Right, right? you reduce something that may be a very complex and very uh, how should I say. Uh, uh, larger than life yeah. experience. And by talking about it and using words to describe it, naturally you reduce it. I, I don't think any way of describing this could uh, come close to what it feels like. But I, I can tell you that in the caves, when you enter those caves, you your whole sense of who you think you are and what, mm -hmm. what you think you are is completely pushed out of you. And you're... you're it's it's you're stunned by the actual space of the caves themselves right. and you're going from one chamber to another chamber and each chamber is a little bit different and uh you're in the bowels of this um immersive experience mm -hmm. that that you that you you cannot get out of you can't talk your way out of it yes. or think <laughs> your way out of it you're there yeah. and you have and you must be there i remember when i walked into one cave it was called la Mut it's uh, over a mile down and you're going down, down, mm -hmm, down, mm -hmm. down. That would be in France down. also. Yeah. yeah. And yep. you think, my God, when is this thing going to end? You know? <laughs> so they went and they entered into those spaces, deeply into them in yeah, many cases. Right. Yeah. Crawling into them sometimes. You know, it was interesting visiting. We visited the, uh, the California cave last week and um, people had left feathers and um, other kinds of gems, uh, gems mm -hmm. and they had a sense of the sacred there, even though you were, you had the, the metal uh, gate there, but they had sort of slipped these things underneath on the floor. Yeah, it was an, a Mexican American uh, mother and her fourteen year old son. Yeah. They were there, and we were chatting with them. And, and they, they were, were feel they were feeling and, the energy there yeah, too. Yeah, and they were lovely. And she's the one that pointed it out to us yeah. because you you know there's a screen up that protects right. the interior the of the cave. So you have to kind of look over the edge of the screen. And they have a little opening for you. A little opening. But she was the one pointing yeah. all this out. And actually, they, he, he, he had this long, beautiful black hair. And uh, he was saying that he could speak the Nawal language. Oh, uh, so he was sort of imagining uh, the Maya also, because we had told him we'd gone to the Maya. But it, it sort of um, invited the sense of the sacred. Yeah. Even the small, intimate cave there. Oh, yeah. It's very special. And I loved your photographs of it. And, you know, actually on the Carolyn Glass, or sorry, on the OhioInstitute.org website, we mm. do have a link to do a 3D visit of the cave as well. Oh, wow. Nice. Uh -huh. so that's also up there. So you should be That'll be fun. I, I, I have a question for you, friend. Which Wait, is how we have a couple of questions for you oh, guys. Oh, good. Okay. Then. then you can ask me a question. Okay. So the first was, um, do you know how they determined the sex of the hands on the cave walls? Do you that, know that size. Is, 
Yeah, I think size and, and length um, of the fingers. But it's a very good question. I think I no, think that's probably what, we read. what it is. Oh yeah, we did is. read that. Yeah, yeah. It's the length of the fingers and the size of the hand itself. And probably the, the even the size of the finger. The way it tapers. The way it tapers. Yeah. yeah. It's a recent uh, you know study that they've been doing, yeah. which I thought was really great. I loved hearing that. Well, and also something I I figure, feel I read something too about that the not only were it was you know different genders but also or sexes but also um, uh, different ages that it was also that what mm -hmm. you know, the ceremonial space that again that you spoke to too about this yeah. kind of coming of age um, you know ritual rites right, of passage the rites of passage yes yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah that was very very important to the ancient peoples and, mm. and of course it's still going on in the indigenous usually travels. in secret yeah but uh they really felt a rite of passage was was critical we're missing that yeah we don't have that in our culture and mm. as a result i think there's a period for many of us where we you know college students and all that i taught for many years and i could see it in the, in mm -hmm. the kids uh, you just don't know who you are, where you are, and, yeah. what, and what's really expected of you. Well, in these cultures, you knew. Mm -hmm. They made mm -hmm. it absolutely clear. You know? <laughs> I, love, I love it. Okay, so we have another um, from some fans of yours here. Um, uh, is there any information about whether the monochromatic pieces may have had color at some time? Perhaps a fruit pigment that did not have the same staying power as the darker inks? similar to the way we now believe that the Greek statues and paintings may have been quite colorful. Right. Which monochromatic? You, you well, mean like the two the case, buffalo? The yeah, two yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Or even the pictographs in the, in the Southwest. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Not that we've heard of. Also, not that we've heard of. Um, the person said also Richard and Deborah are the greatest, just so you know. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, you. as far yeah. as we know, so, in terms so, of the so color. Yeah, so it's, a, I mean, we might have to look into um, into that then about yeah, yeah. the quality. It would be worth, it would be worth it would be, investigating. It would be very interesting. But I mean, the, in, in general, though, what we do know is that they're, I mean, they were earth-based pigments, right? And they were stuck yes. with ochre. Yeah. And That's right. Things that were, you know. And I think even charcoal, and like, I don't know how they, they managed to get it to stay, but uh, we Chavet, have to- The Chauvet came. The Chauvet, yeah. And the Chauvet was, when it was opened in 1994, it had never been entered before. At least Over th as far as 37,000 years, it was just extraordinary, which, why they, it, which is why they had to close it very, very quickly. Yeah. I don't think that it's ever been open to the public. Yeah. See, the, the breath, human breath, uh, creates a, a, a very thin veil of fungus on the wall and over time, it begins to become opaque and obscures what's mm, there. So, mm. it's, it's, so it's amazing um, that uh, there's anything left, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we're, we're almost at six here. What's your question? Oh, yeah. Did you have <laughs> oh, yes. How far, how far does that cave go in, uh, in Santa Barbara? What do you mean oh, go? Oh, I don't know. I think that's it. I think that's... Oh, I think that is it, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's just that. So, it, so it, it's shallow. Yeah. not quite so much of a cave as a shelter. A sacred it's, space yes, you, yeah, you could say that. As a shelter. Okay. You yeah. know, it's on top of the mountain, too. You drive up and you have to go, you know, a good winding distance to get up. It's right up on the top. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, there are, um, I understand, and I also don't know the details of them, but even up here behind Ojai, I believe yes. some other, but again, it is kind of more of an outcropping perhaps, and maybe more along the lines of, of the rock art than, than necessarily a cave per se. But also, right. you know, with yeah. geological changes over millennia, you know, yeah. we're talking a lot of, there's a lot of shifting and, um, you know, we're big fans of Tanya Otwater's you know, animations of the tectonic plates, you know, like- uh, yeah, Oh yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, how these things, how- How they affect it too. Exactly, how the land- Yeah, so, and, and know, that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, so who knows, like- Yeah. If something was painted so long ago, where was everything? Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, well, well, I mean, if, if and we, we could leave a dangling question- I like we that. come to the end, <laughs> okay. which is why is, the handprints, for example, as, as well as other kinds of images. Yeah, like the dot dappling. Why are they yeah. universal? Why they're, are they all over the world? Everywhere. So the suggestion is there was a, a writer, his name was Churchward, at the turn of the century, 19th century, into the 20th, 
who claimed that there was a continent in the Pacific he called Mu, and some people call it um, Lemuria, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and of course Atlantis on, in the Atlantic, mm -hmm. and that all the cultures of the world now uh, stem from those two um, mother cultures. And so these images came from them and they, they became universal. I don't know if that's yeah. so, but. Well, I think that, you know, that was definitely, um, you know, as a closing thought too, a, a key element in, in conceiving this show was about this sort of like, not only the, um, the human, right? The universality of a human need yes. to, Absolutely. to make marks, to share stories and to be in community. Right. Absolutely, that's absolutely. That I think we've all, you know, come to realize perhaps even more in, in these times of, of uh, individual isolation and quarantine. Yeah, that's very but, true. Uh, no. You know, that's... gathering around the fire and, um, yeah. and, and sharing stories and experiences really um, does make us human, right? And, yeah. Yeah. and, and to yeah. find the language that they all could read. Because they all knew how to read the, That's the, right. the language of the caves on the rock. Home. That was being communicated through thousands of years. Yeah, 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 you could read it. You could actually read it. Well, yeah, and that and that and I and this is an issue with it, or a reality of the the cave here in, in outside of Santa Barbara is that it's been reworked. Right, that mm -hmm. the, the there's sort of a um, a timelessness to the art yes. the, the, as well. Right, that if the absolutely there to maintain that we could see that continual maintenance, right? So right. even thinking to, okay, well, these were discovered when and maybe be date to when, but they could have also been maintained again over hundreds of years. Yes. And so you're actually, one cave may represent the marks of hundreds yeah. of thousands of- Absolutely, of, of, and of artists. And I think that's where it's beautiful when you see the hands in some of those hands, those ones, I mean, I had goosebumps looking at those images. Yeah, yeah, me too. All those hands on the wall, you know, and you start mm. thinking about, well, each hand could have been, you know, 10, 20 people or more. You know, it's like yeah. you think about um, even in that minimalist line, right, of the gesture in the cave, but that mm -hmm. times, you know, a child ran their finger over it or a, a shaman, you know, retrace that space um, and that animal. And I think, yeah. I, I just, I just, you know, clearly we have, we, we all have, uh, you and I, you and I all have a, an affinity for this, this conversation. Oh um, yeah. yeah. Well, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. It's really been wonderful to hear um, Deborah and Richard's adventures and where they'd like to go <laughs> to one day and yeah. the impact and the resonance in their own work, whether it's, you know, literal or subliminal or, or, yeah, or yeah. dreamscape, oh. whatever. It all, it all intertwines and intermeshes, right? So yes. um, if you haven't had an opportunity to see the exhibition, I encourage you to see it. Um, you can make an appointment. You can also just buzz outside of Hotel Indigo these days. They're being oh, good, a good. little bit more um, lax now that we're starting to, you know, reopen. But of course, a mask is required. And um, there's also the 3D viewer at the OhioInstitute.org that you can um, pop into. And what do you guys think about that? That was pretty. I thought it was fabulous. I loved it. I really did. It's a lot of fun. And we actually have a lot of friends who have gone and looked at it. There were some moments there that weren't easy to navigate. To get to sort of <laughs> well, you come have around to the wall. There are, there are moments where you have to back up and then go forward. Yeah, yeah, you you do, you do. <laughs> Sometimes you're accidentally on the ceiling and you go. <laughs> <laughs> but but it was fun. Fun. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's just great that it happened. Well, yeah. I'm so happy to have you both in this exhibition. It really means a lot to be able to share your wow. work with. It means a lot to us. Too. To thank you so thank much, you so Freddie. Much. Yeah, thank really you. a pleasure. Thank thank you. Thanks, both, thank everyone. Thank everyone who joined us today. Oh. We look forward to our next adventure. Hope you'll join us. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you soon. See you Bye. soon. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.